And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Outland Entertainment, the chief, the chieftain of the Viking verse, and the and the meh, and the evil genius behind Old Norse for modern times. The one, the one and only Ian Stewart Sharp. How you doing today, man? That's quite the introduction. Thank you very much. I've I've always prided myself on my uh, evil geniusness, so um, I'm glad you cottoned on to that quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So. Between between old between um I'm just between modern times which I'm gonna call it because I'm not paid by the syllable, and the Viking verse, um obviously the, obviously your um enthusiasms lean lean a little bit toward the toward the toward the Norse and the Scan and the Scandinavian kingdoms. With that in mind, I'm curious where I'm curious where the um where that all start where the in interest in that particular area of the world um started. Yeah, so um, if you if you can tell from my accent, then I'm originally from England, or now I now live in Canada. Um, where I grew up is a part of England called East Anglia, uh, so named for the Angles who came over. Uh, East Anglia was part of the Dane law, which was the area of England that was overrun and taken over by the Norse. Guthrum was the king um, who was up against Alfred during the, uh, the, the battles in a, the, the period about 865 onwards. Um, and so I grew up with kind of steeped in all of that history. It's, it's part of the landscape. You know, you can, you can almost uh, see and smell where the the Vikings had, had been, and it's a very flat land. It's a very um, you know you could, the, the horizons loom close, and you can imagine the the longships coming over from the east, riding over the waves and uh, and reaching through the rivers, and uh, unleashing the hordes upon the unsuspecting. Uh, folk of that era so you know there was a there was something there in the fabric of the land that always drew me to uh, Vikings Viking history and you know, then many years later uh, I, I started to dive into it doing my research reading about uh, Norse myths Norse history and that was really then where the whole idea for the Viking verse came to me uh, and, and as you may know, having uh, delved into the books a little bit yourself, it's all about this alternate history where the Norse never Christianized, and that is a pivotal, pivotal moment, um, ties into Guthrum, ties into the Dame Law, ties into the defeat of the Vikings by Alfred the Great, and then eventually the Christianization of the whole Norse, and I wanted to turn that on its head. Mm -hmm. um, now, when it came, when it came to... When it came to that I, that particular idea, was that was that the I, the idea of doing alt, of alternate history when when you were when you were sitting down to to do it was it a was it a case where it all started as a what if as a what if question in in your in your mind or was or was the path there a bit more detailed? There's a there was a couple of ideas that I had in my mind as I was starting to look at the Viking verse. Now, certainly I liked the what if idea, the what if uh, the Norse were never Christianized. That was, that was one part of it. But then I also had the kind of other end of the story, which was this idea of the, the last suns in the sky, the stars winking out one by one. And that's a very... That's very flavorful and I'm remindful of Ragnarok and the Norse twilight of the gods. Uh, that, that whole myth about how the 
the wolves swallow the sun and the moon having chased them across the sky and so i have that idea that that image in mind about just sitting there being the last person on earth gazing at the sky or not necessarily on earth but just somewhere looking at the sky and watching the last star wink out and so there were kind of two cords there two ends of a thread and they slowly got tied together um and the way that they actually got tied together was 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 i was having my own personal ragnarok at the time when i started all of this it was back in 2016 uh, and the company that i was running went horribly disastrously wrong and so out of that kind of personal immolation the, the in the the chaos and flames of a company going under i i came up with the idea of Viking Verse, and some of it was born of playing too many computer games. I sat down and played an awful lot of uh, what was Crusader Kings 2. Crusader Kings 3 is out now, of course, but played a lot of Crusader Kings 2, and and and, and actually conquering the, the world and leading a dynasty through that game. That's very much the what you do. You sit down, you play a... Uh, in my case, I played a Norse Jarl, and then he became... Uh, uh, a Scandinavian king, and then he took over the Rus, and suddenly I thought, well, hang on, there's a, there's, there's something fascinating and organic in this, and that latched onto the what if idea, and then that latched onto the, the far end, the the kind of stars winking out idea that I, uh, or motif that I was talking about, and the whole thing then suddenly gelled, and I thought, ah, I really do have to write this down. I'd, I'd imagine that when it came to when it came to setting up the story that you're going to tell, you ended up going down a historical rabbit hole. Although, since you're playing Crusader Kings two, you already were significantly down a historical rabbit hole as it is. Yeah, you, I mean that alternate history is uh, is a fascinating. You know, it's full of twists and turns down that rabbit hole. Um, but uh, and and you're right when you sit and you think. Well, how, you know, how am I going to make this plausible? How am I going to make this believable? Because Crusader Kings is just a veneer, right? It's just a, uh, you're just painting the map a different colour and the names change. Uh, and that's fascinating in itself. You know, the, 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 the Rus and the kingdoms that we now call Russia actually being uh, the Gatharyki in uh, the Norse tongue and the exonyms, the things that we call different places, uh, were very different for the Vikings. So so that kernel of an idea, the fact that things were called something different uh, by the Vikings, not what we have emblazoned all over maps today, that started me on a path to go, well, let's try and, do, let's try and inject some authenticity into this idea. What would a pagan future look like? What would it be like if you strip away Christianity. What would it be if you strip away the Latin and French influence on the English language? Because that's a, a, a key part of our shared history. 1066, the, the Normans who were themselves Northmen but had been uh, clearly uh, Frenchified. Um, uh, they came over to England, they kicked Harold and his uh, Saxons off the throne and they instituted uh, uh, French legal systems, French language, a lot more Latin, the, the church uh, and the institutions of Catholicism were much more established. So if you take that out of the equation, what are you left with? Um, go back a little bit further and you, know, you, you stop the Christianity of the, Christianization of the, of the English, um, and you have much more Germanic traditions and Germanic legal traditions. Uh, then there starts to something comes into focus, and you can start to see it a little bit more. Now, England, Scotland, you know, the United Kingdom actually do have an awful lot of traces of that Germanic heritage. Still, you can see it in place names. Mm -hmm. You can see it in legal structures, especially in some of the islands, like the Orkney Islands and Shetney Islands. They still have Uda law, which is. Uh, something that came from the Scandinavian forebears. Uh, because England has been this, this kind of, 
this nation that has been overlain with all of these different waves uh, of invasion and waves of people, you can actually start to peel it back. It's a bit like peeling an onion. And once you get to the, that Norse core, there is a good solid foundation for properly envisaging what that pagan past and therefore Norse future that I use in the books uh, would actually be like. It's, uh, it's possible to reconstruct it from history, and that was a fascinating exercise. Mm -hmm. Now, that, do, that, does bring, that does bring me to, to um, Old Norse for Modern Times. Or at, or just mo or again just modern times and th the thing that interests me about that is the idea of the idea of try of trying to apply a language where a lot of the th a lot of the things that we take for granted when it comes to modern English just aren't pre and modern language as a whole just aren't um, present. How did the how did this how did that little project um, get its Get its legs. So, the there's a book called uh, Latin for All Occasions, um, published in 1990 by a guy called Henry Beard, and I've actually got a copy on my desk here somewhere. You can hear the rustling around. I've, yeah, it's here. So, uh, and what Henry Beard did particularly well is he came up with something that I found hilarious. You know, saying, who says Latin is a dead language? Certainly not any public school boy. Um, but while Roman mass may be a thing of the past, Latin's never been livelier. And so he goes through and he, he uh, finds ways to bring Latin to life by making, by revealing modern phrases. Um, and this is, uh, this guy was a... Uh, you know, he was part of National Lampoon, that periodical. He did things like write Miss Piggy's Guide to Life. You know, so he's, he's clearly got that Muppet sense of humour infused through the whole book. And when I got a copy of that back as a university student in the, in the 90s, I thought that was hilarious. And so the notion then of doing a kind of Old Norse version of it uh, had come to me sometime in the in the past 20 years or so uh, and it was only really then once I started writing the the Viking verse that I thought well I'm gonna actually get on and do this I'd come up with enough uh, smatterings of my own uh, Old Norse I'd, I'd started to understand how the language came together and how it was similar in some shapes and forms to uh, English um, and certainly where bits were recognizable um again if he's like stripping away that that veneer of the the french and the latin one of the reasons why the english language has got so many different synonyms for things is we've got you know the french version of of things uh you know say uh you know things like mutton and lamb and beef and cow we've got all of these various different names for the same things and that's because we've got one root of uh, the language is Germanic and one root is French. Um, so what I wanted to do was come up with a humorous phrase book, learning what I had found out in researching the Viking verse, kind of bring the whole thing to life, uh, sprinkle in a bit of that uh, Henry Beard's Latin for all occasions and make something that was just fun, that was funny. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the Vikings are... Um, the Vikings were a, a race of language and poetry. Everyone thinks that they ran around with horns, raping and pillaging, but in actual fact, they were a, a rich culture steeped in an oral tradition, steeped in, in a love of language and a, a kind of deftness of use of language of things that are like the, the kennings that they use to really bring concepts to life. All of that, I thought, needed to be aired uh, in some shape or form, and so Old Norse for Modern Times came about. Mm -hmm. Now, I, one, one, one um, channel that I, fo that I follow on YouTube that does a, lot, does a lot of stuff when it comes to ancient languages is AB Alpha Beta. 
and I will admit that I first found out about them when they decided to do a dub of the biggest dickest um, thing from Monty Python and Monty the Python, yeah. but they dubbed it in Latin and they they had mentioned that there were a, that there were a lot of words in the in the script that they had that they essentially could not find a equivalent in Latin so they had to make something up as a rough equivalent because there's there's no Latin equivalent to biggest dickest so they went with erecto muto yep yep sure <laughs> um when it came to when it came to trying trying to convert modern english words into old norse were there any were there any um words or sounds that that you can think of that just didn't transfer so you had to go with a close enough so yeah that happened lots of times um i should step back at this point and uh mention the fact that we did work with uh, an icelandic professor professor of uh, medieval language called uh angrimur vadalin and he's out of reykjavik mm -hmm. because you know the 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 uh, the notion of uh you know, Josh, who also worked on the book with me, uh, two, two Canadians sitting down and, and pretending that they knew enough Old Norse to make it legitimate. You know, that's, that's, that would be a travesty, not a book. So we did, uh, we did work with uh, Professor Vidalin and, um, and he uh, really put all of the, the Old Norse together. Now, we're talking Old Norse, but there is clearly a, a modern language that is similar to Old Norse, not exact, but a, certainly a kissing cousin of, in the form of Icelandic. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're a professor of uh, language in Reykjavik, you speak Icelandic and you know how to um, reconstruct Old Norse as it might be spoken, and it's it's perhaps most similar to um, Shakespearean English. We can read Shakespearean English uh, perfectly fine; it makes perfect sense. Uh, if you stepped back further and you're looking at Chaucer and uh, early modern English, or you're looking at uh, the, the the real old English or the, the the Saxon use of it, then it starts to look a bit more like gobbledygook. But yeah. the the version of Old Norse, as it, especially as it's in the Icelandic sagas, is very well preserved in modern Icelandic. Mm -hmm. um, now, your question really was around how on earth you translate certain terms, uh, such as, you know, let's take an example of telephone. How do you, how do you come up with the word for telephone you know, since, since the Vikings of the 11th century certainly didn't have a word for it? But what, what Icelandic um, language preservationists do is they actually have an institute where, where when uh, these neologisms, new words pop up and they have to find uh, a word for it, they don't just use uh, a variant of English. They don't just, you know, stick a, a funny sounding name in, you know, like, like Telefonsky or something as, as some Slavic languages might do. They, they actually reach into that Old Norse poetic tradition and they try and find a word perhaps fallen out of use, um, perhaps something that is only referenced once or twice by the skalds of, uh, of the sagas. But in the case of the telephone, they use the word simi, which means thread. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the kind of thing they did. They resurrected this word for a long piece of thread and they use that for uh, telephone. And there's all kinds of examples uh, like that um, television. I won't do justice for the, to the pronunciation, but that is effectively uh, far sight or, or throne sight, uh, schwannvorp. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's all of these kind of compound words that the uh, Icelandic language gurus put together that both are the uh, the essence of the the word in question, 
um, and also you know just the, the kind of perfect poetic encapsulation of what that word means i mean television is literally you know it's a it's a it's a greek word and it means you know to uh, far sight in itself right and so the 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 norse version of that means exactly the same thing it's just made up of different compound elements so when you are looking for phrases and we're talking about it with the professor and coming up with ways in which we would translate things that don't make sense or don't have uh, a uh, an old or genuine um, alternative, then we just make them up on the same on the basis of those same guidelines, right? Reaching back into the archives. Now there are some things if you got a hold of uh, the book. There's a there's a handful of footnotes, perhaps six or seven through the book, where things literally cannot be translated. You just can't do it, or it, it doesn't make sense to that uh, to the Viking mindset. Um, and so, in those instances, uh, we've taken there's a footnote, and we explain where we've used a phrase from the sagas that is in the spirit of uh, that. A translation it's not a word for word translation but it's the same kind of thing and uh yeah there are there are a handful of examples of that where it did defy us but it was actually funnier to choose something that would have uh yeah been said by one of the scowls of old that meant something uh, along the same lines mm -hmm. now when it came when it came to the other thing the other thing that i could see having i could see having some difficulty is in is in certain fr is in certain um in certain fr in certain phrases and the way certain um certain sounds work simply simply because from my brief st from my brief study into old norse there are certain um there are certain phonetic sounds that are that are common that are commonplace in modern English that don't exist in um, in Old Norse. I think w I think one of them was a was a variant of a of a kind of soft as a kind of soft C. It would be it would be looked at as a um, K instead. Were yeah. So in, there are, there are there are a bunch of characters as well, mm -hmm. um, like like Ash and Thorn. Um, that used to be part of the English language, and they just kind of got simplified out. So the, uh, they do look very alien to, to people who are used to pure English text and English QWERTY keyboards, that kind of thing. Um, and and it, was, it was because we moved into print, and we, we had this oral tradition, we had... Or, or the Norse had an oral tradition and they had runes, they had their own alphabet. Um, runes come about as a kind of uh, alternative to Latin script. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm stepping back in time here, I'll just give you a, a brief tour, but uh, and then I'll come back to your question. But basically, uh, you have Scandinavian mercenaries in the 5th or 6th century hanging about with Romans, see writing for themselves, come back with Roman gold, start uh, creating their own system of uh, letters called, uh, that they call runes, um, occasionally inscribe them on sticks as messages or, or, or carve them into great big boulders for, to memorialize events. And uh, you know, that, there's, there's a whole new language there that we often uh, or, or scholars refer to as Futhark, right? So though the, there's a lot of the letters of the, uh, it starts off as the elder Futhark and then it becomes the younger Futhark with less letters and it simplifies itself. Um, and then as Christianity happens, the Latin alphabet reasserts itself. Runic uh, communication becomes something for uh, for villagers or, or for you know, graffiti on the, on the back of church pews and uh, certainly falls out of um, educated modern usage um, and so 
again, these these few characters that are alien to us stem back to that time, and they're still in use in um, definitely in um, in Iceland, uh, in certain other forms of Norwegian as well, or dialects. So there's a there's a language called Elf Dalian. Um, that uh, that also uses some of these characters, but the interesting thing is 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 that um you know that I've sprinkled them through the novels as well as uh, old Norse modern times, and um, I found that people just just kind of look at them in horror. They go, "Oh my God, how am I meant to pronounce that?" Yes. But the funny thing is, is is that they really are just just ways in which you shape your mouth to utter a sound. That's all the letter is, mm-hmm. and so so. You know the the A E uh, conglomeration where they're joined up in in Ice, which is the name given to uh, the Norse gods, um, the, the 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 clan that Thor and Odin come from. That's relatively easy to pronounce. It's just a, more of a more of an I sound, as, as in almost as in ice, um, and the T H is. Uh, or, or rather, the the you know, the thorn is is effectively a, a, a th sound, a slightly you know, slightly shortened th sound. But that's really what we're doing with letters. We're just using them to make sounds, and and so that's a long answer to your uh, your question. Now, I haven't actually had to wrestle too much with that myself. We have done an audio version of the uh, the book, um, and. Uh, the host of the Myth and Law podcast, a uh, wonderful, talented woman called Siobhan Clark, has been doing that for us. She's effectively worked with Professor Vidal and learnt Old Norse pronunciation and delivered it all with her wonderful Scottish lilt. Um, the, the Scots, as you know, were, were under uh, Norse control have more Norsemen around longer than the, the English did and some of their rolled R's and uh, and other pronunciations are still very similar to the northern tongue whereas most Englishmen like myself are, are, are lucky to be able to uh, pronounce anything foreign in a convincing way you know my 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 French and German is uh, still schoolboy skill level mm-hmm. um now having having this having this kind of material out, out is fair, is fairly is fairly interesting to me for a for a different re, for a different reason um in the last now i am i'm i'm quite the i'm quite the music nerd although i don't i don't consider i don't consider myself a hipster into that i'm not fantano or something or something like that but um for several for for quite a few years um, one one particular one particular genre of music that's that has been on the has been on the upswing, especially in Europe, has been um, folk metal. Um, a lot of it a lot of it is just is just mixing, um, well, literally folk so- folk songs or sto- or storytelling with um, with metal, and a lot of it coming from the various parts of Scandinavia. Um, and there's and Within that, there's be, there's been some there's been some inter there's been some interplay with with um with pe- with people having a I guess an I guess a neo pagan approach when it comes to when it comes to Viking culture. What in in your experience, what would you say is the draw when it come when it comes to when it comes to it? Do you think it do you think it's a return return to return to a return to a a um past or do you think or do you think it's something else yeah, there's definitely something about people's roots and the rootedness of it all um i think that there's there's quite a lot to unpack within that so identity is is one part of it right where do i come from what what do i uh believe in where who are my people now the the challenge with with that and and going down that path and looking into genetics and um 
you know, the, the, the family tree and the records. Uh, you often see people say, well, I'm part Viking. Um, and, you know, the, the challenge is, is to gently tell people, well, you're not. Um, you, you know, I appreciate it resonates with you. I appreciate, you know, that there's a zeitgeist around Vikings right now. I appreciate that um, you probably do have European ancestry. Um, a lot of people, uh, you know, in, on outside of the world do. Um, and, and, and maybe it's Northern European uh, ancestry as well. You know, the, the English and the Scandinavians were always great travelers and colonizers. Um, but the the very nature of being a Viking was it was a it was a it was a part time gig. It was a, it was something you did on occasion. You went on a raid. You went a Viking. You took time out of the fields um, and you stopped fishing for a while and you went and uh, acted like a pirate. That's that's really what a Viking is. Now. Um, so you can say, well, am I descended from the Norsemen? Am I descended from, from pagan roots? And so I think that some people there are saying that the modern world is uh, too complicated or, or, or that the modern world is too um, clinical uh, or that the spirituality of the modern world um, or the organized religions of the modern world don't satisfy something that people are, are longing for uh and you know we've we've there's a long tradition across um a lot of the northern hemisphere of organized religion and church attendance falling by the wayside and uh and, and a lack of religiosity um and what used to be sacrosanct and what used to be drummed into people about you know, Sunday worship and um, uh, bedtime prayers and all of that kind of stuff just isn't a reality anymore. And perhaps there is a vacuum, perhaps there's an absence of stuff that people are hoping to, to fill. And certainly, as we know, since the 60s and 70s, um, pagan faiths and, and, and churches or temples or hofs uh, and societies and fellowships that are uh drawn to uh norse mythology norse spirituality have come to the fore um and I think they're searching for answers and they're trying to find their own truths and and that's that's valuable and that's uh that's worthwhile i just wouldn't get it mixed up with the viking stuff the viking yeah. stuff is uh, uh, yeah, that's those are people who went on a raid out of necessity or out of the need to get wealth, out of the need to survive. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's an entirely different thing to um, to want to find some kind of spirituality that makes sense to you that you can uh, that, that resonates with you, um, and that is very very different to modern Christianity and. Bring, bringing up the um, bringing up that whole way when you mentioned the whole pe people aren't necessarily descended from Vikings but more of this more of descended from one of the nations that po that possibly made up um, Scandinavia in that regard um, that's that can certainly apply because with a lot with a lot of the bands that have um, arose within that within that um, zeitgeist of folk metal um, none of them ever refer to never, none of them ever refer to the um, the approach the approach that they have as vi as Viking s that's been something that's um, inflict <laughs> for lack of a better term inflicted on them by uh, by others but um, say twir and I'm ho I'm, I probably butchered the pronunciation but it's the but best I can do um, is um, Faroese for in for instance. Um, Enciferum, I believe, is from Finland, although um, a metal band from Finland that's um, <laughs> it's not exactly a high bar to cross, <laughs> and so and so on. And I th I think a a bit of a cul a bit of a culmination of the of of that um, of that zeitgeist and that shift, which 
had had been kind of going slowly for a while is see is seeing a manga like Vinland Saga get made into um into an anime. And Vinland Saga is a interpretation of Eric the Red. Yep. So, but but everything's an interpretation, isn't it? And that's that's really the the point. We cannot possibly hope to open a window onto that world. Yeah. Um, we can't really put ourselves in the mindset of this people in a thousand years ago because their their lives and their beliefs were so alien. And there's a there's a couple of books by a guy called Neil Price. Um, the first is called The Viking Way, uh, and the second is called The Children of Ash and Elm. Um, and, and what he tries to do is to make that point that, that um, trying to understand all of the various aspects of Norse culture through a modern lens is almost doomed to fail. And the very fact that you know, they, the, prior to Christianity, they didn't believe in the, in the, the soul. They didn't even really worship gods in the same way that uh we do today when you know when people are doing sacrifices and and leading chants uh you know or or, or banging drums the vet uh you know as they do in some of the bands that you're describing you know it's all cut it's all um there's a lot of musicality linked to the norse traditions mm -hmm. but but again it's 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 all so far removed and so impossible to see that all it can ever be is an approximation. And one of the one of the things I'm just I'm, I'm looking at now because we're uh, you know as we delve further into the Viking verse and I'm planning more content and more episodes is just you know those those four main constituents of the Norse soul, the Norse self. Mm -hmm. The soul itself, soul, and the old Norse for its sal was you know, was only ever came into uh, the vernacular after Christianization. But they have the uh, the ham or the hammer. They have the huga, so which is so the first one is shape, the second one is thought. Um, they have the filge, uh, which is uh, this notion of a of a follower or a fetch, very similar to uh, the daemons that you might have seen in his dark materials. Um, and then they also have this, this, this notion of the Hemingia, which is uh, a, a kind of personification of luck, a, a guardian spirit that follows you around and the strength of which is dependent on your own roots, your own ancestry, your own... Um, uh, the, the, the things that your family has done and enabled it's the it's the kind of embodiment of and the representation of your ancestors and so all of those things were actually the constituents of the norse self um in the same way as that we might say mind body and soul today well they said uh huger hammer uh uh and heminia and that in itself is just so different that uh, is very difficult to, um, to to straddle that divide and 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 to go back and think yeah I, well I I do have this Norse ancestry you know I do have this uh, Norse belief system you, you have an approximation of it you have a modern interpretation of it and I applaud you for trying to delve deeper into your spiritual roots, just understand that you can't possibly accurately represent it, partly because the Norse never wrote anything down in great volume. And when they did, it was several hundred years after the fact. And so, you know, imagine if someone in 300 years from now was writing about uh, World War II, you know, are they, are they going to get it accurate? No. It's uh, things are lost to the past, mm -hmm. and that's all. That's all. That's also why it's a um, why you have why you can have so many ver. We I believe that's also why you can have so many variants when it comes to just the um, sagas, where a lot where a lot of the a lot of the contents of them is um, 
up to is up to very heated debate. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, Snorri, um, all, all of the Norse myths that you know and love today mm -hmm. um, are, are entirely down to one man, Snorri Sturluson, writing them down um, you know, hundreds of years after they happened. And, and um, or not even happened, hundreds of years after uh, they were first told, and then they've all morphed in the intervening time uh, through the advent of Christianity. So, for example, the best example of, of all of this, to my mind, is, is elves and dwarves, right? So, we, today, we, everything's been Tolkienized, and we think of elves as, uh, as these uh, graceful forest dwellers with pointy ears who are good with a bow, and then dwarves are uh, uh, short stuff with axes and beards and bad tempers. Um, mm -hmm. but, but these creatures were, you know, owe their origin to um, st stories from the Norse of, you know, of, of over a thousand years ago. And originally, um, they were pretty much one and the same, dwarves and elves. They were, there's certainly no real distinction uh, between them that's laid out in a meaningful way in the sagas. There's no real, this is what an elf is, this is what a dwarf is. They just, they're, they're used interchangeably. Um, and then subsequently, when Snorri comes along and you know, he's, he's, perhaps he's been tainted by the idea of angels, you know, certainly by the time he was writing, Christian scripture and the Bible was, was everywhere. Um, and perhaps he's doing it unknowingly, perhaps he knew full well what he was doing when he was describing you know, light elves and dark elves and, uh, you know, light elves are, are almost angelic and dark elves are these chthonic creatures who live under the ground, um, who are similar to dwarves, um, if not exactly the same as dwarves. And everything just becomes a mismatch. Everything gets mixed into one. And now from this, from where we sit, we sit back and go, okay, well, what's, What's a, what's a light elf and what's a dark elf and what's a dwarf? Just a, there's no way you can possibly tell from any of this stuff. And the one guy that is telling you this from his vantage point in the Middle Ages has bundled everything together and conflated centuries of myth into what's then tantamount to uh, a good story, but not anything that's genuinely authentic. We will never know... Uh, with 100% certainty, what the Old Norse really thought that an alpha or an elf uh, was. It was something like a demigod, it was something equivalent to the, uh, the Aesir, Aesir the, the race of gods. You know, certainly in, in uh, poems like uh, The Flighting of Loki, Loki Senna, um, he, uh, you know, he accuses gods of having, or Freya, I think, of having slept with all of the elves in Asgard. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so they're akin to gods, but exactly what they were, all we can say is they definitely weren't pointy-eared forest dwellers who were good with a bow. No, they probably were jerks, though, because, 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 well... I have to get one, I have to get one joke out of my system involving my pathological hatred of elves. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. Elves elves deserve to be denigrated. Um in part in part because if you look at a lot of fantasy settings over over the decades, elves always find some way to make things worse. That that and ju that and just being assholes. I mean dwarves are assholes too, but at least they're up front with it. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I think yeah, I don't know if you've read Terry Pratchett at all. Terry Pratchett did oh, a good I, take on elves. I I love I love um, Pratchett, and I've I've made I've made many jokes in the in the past about how the the best interpretation of de of death came from um, Discworld. Yep, yep. Speaking in capital letters, can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. oh. Now, funnily enough, I mean, again, without dwelling too much into spoilers, one of the 
you, in the All Father Paradox, the first of those Viking verse novels, Church Warden Michaels, who is a, an English church warden who is custodian of a real Viking cross uh, in a place called Gothsworth in Cumbria. Uh, the, the cross exists, and, and it, it is this kind of story that we're talking about. It's, it's this place in England was a, a crossroads between Norse settlers, uh, Saxon villagers. Irish raiders, all kinds of things, and it was also at this confluence of time where uh, Norse thought and Christian teachings collided, and they got inscribed on this great big cross that's I don't know, fifteen foot tall, um, telling the story of uh, Ragnarok, but also possibly telling the story of the crucifixion at the same time, and. So the, the cross is there, you can still see it today, it's in, uh, in Cumbria in England in the Lake District, not far from where Wordsworth uh, wandered, lonely as a cloud, not far from where Beatrix Potter sat down and, uh, and wrote about Jemima Puddle Duck. Um, but this Gosford cross is there, and the reason I tell this part of the story is because Rincewind, um, who you'll be very familiar with from practice novels, Rincewind was always in the back of my mind when I was writing Church Warden Michaels uh, and, uh, and his character, there's, there's, a, there's a touch of Rincewind's DNA in, in Michaels and a little bit of Arthur Dent as well from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yeah. Um, although, although given that illusion, I have, I have to... I have to the, when you mentioned Rincewind, the, the immediate thing that came to mind was, has anybody, has anybody tried to kill this character yet? Because let's be honest, everybody's tried to kill Rincewind. I'm pretty sure I've tried to kill Rincewind, and now and now, and he doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The the uh, yeah, uh, narrowly avoiding death is uh, is is an entertaining character trait. Mm -hmm. But what now? One of the now one of the other um at one of the other aspects that you that um you've expanded into when it comes to the when it comes to the viking verse um especially especially more recently is is doing is doing side works in um, graphic novel form so what i'm cu what i'm curious about with that is how is was that something that you had always planned for was it something that you did you did on a on a on a suggestion and what were so, what were some of the habits you had to learn or unlearn when go, going from um, comic book going from uh, graphic novel writing to at, with a as a um, as someone who has a background with um, novel writing? So the comics uh, they're called the the Jotun War, um, and they are set in the same universe as. The All Father Paradox, because again, what we what what the what we have there is this alternate universe where Christianity never you know, uh, overtook the Norse, and so the the Vikings by the modern period uh, are fighting the Jotun War. Now, so again, so similar to what I've just been talking about, right? Instead of there being, instead of in our modern world when we demonize the Nazis, for example. Um, you know that, that we make battles between uh, the good guys and the bad guys. It's that it's, we're on the side of angels. Mm -hmm. right? We use Christian terms. Uh, you know, Hitler is the is evil personified. He's the devil incarnate. Mm -hmm. But if you strip away angels and demons because they don't exist because Christianity never took hold, then you're left with the beings from Norse mythology, the the, the equivalent uh, of demons are the Jotnar now. You know, we over the years again. This is a kind of language issue. Is that you know they've been conflated with giants. Uh, giants or giant is actually a French word. But the 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 Jotnar of old um, were were more likely to be like devourers. That's probably what the the name means. Um, and so you've got this notion of the the. These are the bad guys. They're not demons. They're the Jotnar. Um, but they're not. You know, the, the the comics tell the story of the fact that they're not even the bad guys. These, this is a this is a struggle for freedom. This is the uh, this is a rebellion against the purity 
racial purity of the of the the Norse, who are equivalent of our own modern day Nazis. You know, so these these people rise up, and they rise up in the form of uh, Norse mythology. They take their genetic blueprint from the beasts and legends of old, uh, and they wage this war of freedom. So that's that's what the uh, the comic book series is all about. Now it's referenced in the uh, All Father Paradox and uh, and Loki's Wager. But it, it, to your question of how is it different and how easy it is to write, the reason we came up with the comic book series is we always wanted to tell this as a multimedia story. I, I like the idea that um, you can put some of it in text and and tell a story in a novel. And then you can tell, especially the war aspect, I mean, writing a battle and then drawing a battle, especially with these great big behemoths, uh, it's much, much more, comes much more readily to life in comic book form. And so very early on with Outland Entertainment, the publisher, we talked about doing comic book series and, and an approach uh, that would augment the novels, the, the Yotam War, uh, the, the fourth um, the fourth in the series will be kick-started soon. The collected edition in the fourth in the series brings it all to a conclusion and we may well do more uh, you know, after that. In terms of how we need to pull together, I actually started off as a, as a television producer um, and, and a, a comic book, if you think about those frames the boxes in each on each page, those are very similar to uh, a, a movie script or a TV script. You're describing what's in the box. You're describing what's going to be on the TV screen. You know, those are the similar kind of things. A bit of stage direction, uh, a bit of verbiage, a few speech bubbles, and the whole thing comes together. They're actually a lot easier to write because we're inherently visual people. I think um, writing a hundred thousand words for a novel is like running a marathon writing a comic book is a breezy 1500 meters yeah no, i've um and given that given that have you have you ever had any any situation where the um where when writing the script for for the comic you had to dial you um had to dial yourself back a little bit um, I mean, what I've tried to do with the comics is, is, is retain all of the bits about the Viking verse that are important, which is the, you know, the, the, the rootedness, the, the kind of authenticity. It has to be a believable universe, and it's a believable universe because even though the Jotun War tells the story of this alternate World War II or an alternate Russian Revolution all kind of blended together, what it, what it, what it still does is, it's, in my mind at least, it's built on uh, a fully realized alternate history timeline. I've got working documents uh, here that retell world history from various different points of divergence in the Middle Ages all the way through to the modern day. Um, yeah, so I've, 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 I've got a full history of the Viking verse uh, the inventions of the Viking verse, the nations of the Viking verse, the religions of the Viking verse, uh, and all of that exists. When you put it into comic book form, you do have to simplify, but also there's still smatterings of Old Norse. Mm -hmm. There's still renditions of eerily familiar songs. It, you, you, all of this, the point with Old Norse and Old English is they are kissing cousins. They are very close. A lot of our institutions in in America and Canada and the UK and all across the Commonwealth are all similar to uh, Germanic traditions. Our law system, our representative democracy, all of that kind of stuff. Even you know, things like our sense of, uh, I don't know, honour and uh, the, the, the kind of determination to get things done, the work ethic, all of those kind of things are, are still... Uh, go back to those early years and so a lot of it is familiar and and that's that's what i want to play with i want to play with the fact that oh, man this is this is kind of believable oh 
and I, I can cer I can certainly uh, see, I can certainly see that in a, lo in a lot of the work that you've done. Um, with that kind of thing in mind, what does the, obviously you're get, you're going to be gearing up for um, issue four of the Jotun War um, fairly soon? But beyond that, what does the future hold for the Viking verse? A bit of a scoot because I'm not sure that we've uh, talked about it anywhere else. But what I'm doing in the background now is writing up uh, a whole RPG that will be bringing to life sometime in the next uh, few months, maybe September, October time frame. Um, now you're speaking my language. <laughs> well, and so that's so we're um, we're going to work with the rule set for Shadows of the Demon Lord. Um, and build upon that, and so I, you know, I've literally just before speaking to you today, I've been working out all my uh, character classes, the magic system, um, and uh, the the origin system. You know, the 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 you know, my elves. You'll be glad to know won't be pointy eared forest dwellers, um, and uh, they will be causing all kinds of havoc and destruction. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, and so and so that's that's what I'm sitting and building right now. Um, there is a third novel that I really need to uh, uh, commit to the page that's been somewhat delayed by COVID, right? I mean, I'm sure everyone can empathise that a year's worth of COVID chaos kind of takes the you know sucks the creative juices out of you. Um, so we did Old Norse last year. Um, and got that launched during COVID, and so the third and final book in the in the novel series will be done after the RPG, and then who knows from there? Because, like I said, the the it, it really does depend on the whether there's whether people are interested, whether there's an appetite. I think that I think it's a fascinating concept. This uh, alternate universe. I think there's a million places where I can. You know, write stories and play around with. Perhaps we'll do an anthology. There's uh, uh, Josh Gillingham, who's my um, co-author on Old Norse, has just launched uh, an, uh, uh, an anthology based upon uh, his um, board game Althingi, and he's he's interlaced a whole bunch of authors writing in his universe, writing about the interplay between Muslims and vikings and so that's uh, in the middle of kickstarter now so you know there's 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 such richness here um i don't think that vikings are ever going to fall out of the popular imagination they 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 can there's so many different aspects to them i think that even when people get attracted by the the uh paganness or the uh you know the Scandinavian death metal or whatever is their inroad into this, they soon find that there's so much more and so much uh, depth beyond the stereotype that it's worth diving into, worth fully understanding and fully embracing. Oh, and I'll will certainly be keep I'll certainly be keeping an eye on how, on how that kind of thing um, gets gets set up. And I do, I do applaud your, I do applaud your choice in what system you're going to be using for that project. <laughs> um. Yeah, I play a lot of Five uh, E as a as a DM for my kids. I run a couple of campaigns. Um, you know, right now we're doing Out of the Abyss for the the eleven and twelve year olds, and um, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden for the thirteen fourteen year olds. And you know, I, and I took. I had a thirty-year hiatus between dungeon mastering. Um, I used to play it when I was a kid. Took a break, brought it back out, um, having visited a friend of mine at Wizards of the Coast and got a free copy of the game a couple of years ago. We got the kids interested, and we've been DMing. Um, D and D is. I don't think can do the Viking verse justice, whereas Shadow of the Demon Lord has kind of got that. That chilling spine, that that darkness to it, that I think is essential. Oh, all right. Not, like I said, I'll cert I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how that can how that kind of thing de develops with time. 
Um, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the uh, madness here. That's been great to talk to you. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And if you are, and if it is being, if you are drinking, it has to be mead. <laughs> okay, Very I didn't that last part, but that's it. But I figured I'd, um, I figured I'd have, I figured I can get away with a little bit of pandering. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>